Gosh, I want to start, before I jump in um, to my preach this morning, I just want to start by saying, I've just as I was worshipping then, I just felt this like overwhelming thankfulness and just like feeling it's such a privilege to be around at such a time as this in the life of this church. Um, it is exciting. God is doing stuff amongst us, so much stuff. Like the church is growing. Like numerically on a Sunday, we're just seeing more and more people come in. That's thanks to each one of you inviting people along to say, come and see. Come and see what Jesus is like. Come and be a part of the family. That's down to you. Thank you. But God is doing 95, not, let's say 99.999% of the work, right? Um, he is here doing his thing. He's turning up. He's showing up and showing off, as we say um, around here. And it is such a privilege to be a part of it in this season and at this time. So I get this morning the enviable task of preaching on fasting. <laughs> it's one of those things that I think in the life of the church we can come to and, and uh, Kev was joking about it earlier um, it's one of those topics that we're like oh fasting okay um, and I was um, thinking about it in my preparation for preaching I was thinking about um, a story essentially of when I was quite a lot younger over 20 years ago maybe 25 years ago um, when um, I remember in the summer, coming towards the end of the summer, we were asked by our rugby coach from school to go on a, essentially what was a boot camp. And we would go to this place, Landrindod Wells, I didn't say that very well, he was a Welsh guy, fiery character, red hair, um, a bit like Craig. And um, anyway, so he invited us to this place that he obviously knew really well, and uh, we get there, we're all excited, and what does he get us doing? Running up hills. Running up hills, up and down, and up and down. You know, I was 13, 14, 15 at the time in those, those years. Um, and I remember thinking as I was going up this hill, probably for the like 10th time running up, I am knackered, my muscles are burning. What is the point? And it felt a bit like one of those Kevin and Perry moments. It's that kind of shows my age. Does everyone know that? Um, Kevin and Perry, um, you know, I can't be bothered. Ugh. And that's kind of how it felt. But why, why did our coach do that? Well, it wins games. That's why. It increases your stamina, your endurance, and of course your fitness. After a summer of kind of having fun and not doing that much, um, particularly maybe physically, um, it's hard work. It feels pointless, right, in the moment. It requires somewhat strength of mind. Someone like pushing you on going, come on, keep going. You might feel... A bit like that right now, coming towards the last week of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. But do you know what? Like, I look back at it now, and I look at the games that we played in rugby, and I remember once in one game, I ran from our 22 all the way to the touchline, sprinting, and I made it, and it won the game. Why was that? Well, because of the training that kind of happened before. I might not have seen it in that moment, but that's why it was. Fasting's hard. Huh? <laughs> Let's be honest. Have you had those moments during this time where you felt like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, a bit like running up the hill. Oh, come on. Your tummy's rumbling after a few hours. You might be getting one of those like really searing headaches when basically you're withdrawing from sugar um, and your body's screaming at you to eat something. It's tricky, right? So I understand why we've got the jokes about preaching on fasting. It's hard. It's really hard. And I come today fully understanding it. You know, I'm the spiritual formation pastor, but fasting for me over this season has been one of the most tricky things to do in my season of life. Two young kids, it's go, go, go. I need energy. Fasting doesn't kind of fit in that framework, does it? It used to be a strength of mine, but I'm now kind of learning again. So I come in humility to offer kind of what I have on the subject. 
Um, I come understanding and relating, um, hopefully, to how hard it is. So I'm just going to do some really simple things this morning. Three points. I'm going to do what, how, and why. I'll finish on the why, because that's kind of the most important bit, really. Um, But I'll finish there. I want to say, though, in our cultural moment, and here's the serious point, in our cultural moment, fasting is one of the most significant of the spiritual disciplines or practices that we have. Why? It's about self-denial in an age of self-gratification. It's completely otherworldly. And that is why it is so important that we grasp a hold of this, friends. It's really, really, really important to us. The world around us is screaming at us, get what you want when you want it. Have it now. Get a loan, have it now. Do this, have it now. But this is a practice that helps us to kind of centre ourselves a bit more on what's really, really important. And I'll go into that. So, point number one, what is fasting? Well, essentially, prayer and fasting go together hand in hand. Prayer, um, the reason why is because fasting for me is praying with your body. It's like using your body to pray to God. It's a way for us to demonstrate to God and to ourselves that we're serious about our relationship with him. Fasting helps us gain a new perspective and a new reliance upon God. In the Bible, there are Multiple different fasts that we can read about, but I've kind of categorized them into three uh, main types of fast. There's a regular fast. This is number one. So abstaining from all food, solid and liquid, except for water. In the time of the people of God, they had a regular fast. So it was like Wednesdays and Fridays would be the times that they would fast. And it would usually be a 12-hour fast. It was from sunrise until sunset. So a little bit similar to to like Ramadan. So um, in Islam, that's what they do um, during that festival. But essentially, the people of God down through the ages have done this thing. Examples of it, Judas, uh, when Judas King Jehoshaphat called for a, a fast like this when his country was threatened um, with invasion. He called for this fast. Then there's the second type of fast, there's a partial fast. And um, some of you might have actually come across this in the dieting world. It's, a, it's called a Daniel fast. Um, but this isn't a fad diet Um, This is a type of fasting. Um, And we read about it in Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. It says this, At that time I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips. And I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. So in this fast, he wasn't fasting absolutely everything. It was certain things for a certain amount of time. So for three weeks, he did this. And many Christians today follow this particular example. So they'll they'll maybe abstain from certain foods or activities, for, for example, for a short time in order to look to God for their comfort and strength. I don't know if, if many of you have kind of done this over the, the 21 days of prayer and fasting. So maybe instead of the first like regular fast abstaining for, from food, you may have been abstaining from social media. You may have been so, from sweets or maybe that drink at the end of the night or something like that. Something that's kind of specific and over a particular time frame. 
So regular fast, number one. Number two, partial fast, um, just like Daniel. And then number three, an absolute fast. So no food or water is consumed. So this is examples of this. Um, Esther, so she fasted for three days with her fellow Jews um, when there was the threat of them being annihilated essentially in Persia. And so she did this before asking the king for his mercy in Persia. And then there's another example of a three-day absolute fast. It was Saul's conversion, actually, if you've read that in Acts. So it says this, for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And then after that, he preached Christ to everyone that he encountered. So he received his sight back and then he preached to anyone he encountered. And then in terms of absolute fast, there were some miraculous absolute fasts. We know that medically... You cannot live without water for very long. I won't give you an exact time. Dr. Mim's looking at me right now, so I won't do that. But it's not very long that you can live without water. But there were some examples in Scripture of absolute fast for 40 days. Is that possible, Dr. Mim? (laughs) Anything is possible with God. Good answer. Right there. (laughs) It's miraculous. So Moses and Elijah are examples um, of this in the scripture. We know that um, Jesus had a 40-day fast, didn't he, in the wilderness? And we read in the scripture um, that the enemy comes to him. It says, I, I love this line in scripture, it says that he was hungry. What an an underestimation that was like. Um, Anyway, that's what it said. And the enemy comes to him. And you would think, right, that after 40 days, you would be at your most vulnerable. 40 days without food, nothing. And you'd be at your most vulnerable. What was the first thing that the enemy throws at him? Hey, look, there's a rock right here. You've got miracle working power, turn it into bread. You're hungry. What we can see and read from this story is that actually Jesus was stronger and more powerful as a result of his fast than he would have been before. It's just a little thing to throw in there. But spiritually, he was firing on all cylinders. And he threw all of the temptations back at the enemy. Incredible. So, regular fast, partial fast, and absolute fast. And usually in scripture and down through the ages, it has been about food. That's, you know, I'm not going to lie to you there. That's what it's been about. And I know that in our day and age, we, um, we will fast different things. And quite rightly, some for medical conditions, particularly like diabetes, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, things like that. It's, it's important. But what a fast is not is a way to twist God's arm <laughs> to kind of respond to our prayers and requests, a bit like a genie in a bottle. So we don't fast to sort of go, come on, God, do this, do this thing, God. We're not doing that. True fasting seeks after God himself. And all other blessings and benefits are secondary to that. Fasting um, is not also, in a, when we're doing it from a Christian perspective, is not a way to lose weight or to diet. I know that um, fasting has become one of those things that people are realizing the benefits of fasting on the body, you know, there's those uh, fasts that we, intermittent fasting it's called. Just as, a, as an aside, Jesus knew that, God knew that, he made us, <laughs> he created us. So when science is saying, hey, this is actually good for you, did you know that? We're like, yeah, Christians and the people of God have been doing it down through the centuries 
It's more for a spiritual thing, but hey, there's the benefit on your body too. Anyway, that's an aside. So, that's a bit of what. Okay, well, how? Number two, how? There are so many different ways. I've said a couple already. There might, you might want to do a 12-hour fast. Um, sunrise to sunset. So, maybe skip breakfast and lunch and eat um, when the sun goes down or in the evening uh, to work for, for you. In the ancient world, I've read this earlier this week, nursing mothers would fast by skipping breakfast and eating at noon. So they were aware of their stage and aware of what they're going through and what their body needed, but they were like, okay, we're going to join in for a few hours. That's what we can do. And I, I thought that was amazing that they would do that because actually that shows, I think, a pattern for us. Maybe start small if you're struggling with this and you've got that like burn in your muscles, as it were, when it comes to fasting. You're like, ah, this is really hard. Start small. Just start small. Maybe skip one meal to start with and work up from that. You know, I'm, I'm not recommending doing a 40-day fast right off the bat. But, you know, do something small. Um, and start the trajectory um, in your spiritual walk. But what about if you have a medical condition, like I've already said, maybe diabetes or something else that precludes you from fasting food? Well, basically, fast something that holds you in a way that food does. What could that be for you? Maybe social media, like I've said. Maybe it's you've got a, a crazy sweet tooth and you kind of crave lots of chocolate, Stephen. Um, maybe um, <laughs> it's that drink at the end of the day. I know that um, an example um, for my mum was a few years back now. She had a, a particular thing for buying clothes all the time and not just like, nice cheap clothes, they were really expensive ones. And Jesus kind of put his finger on it and said, right, I want you to fast that thing for a whole year. And he asked her to do that in the year that my sister was getting married. So she couldn't go into the shops and buy an expensive thing. She held to that. She made a dress. She got someone to make a hat for her and all this kind of stuff, which for my mum was a really big thing. I don't know if anyone can kind of relate to that, but I'm just kind of saying there's different ways to do this. But essentially, it's something that's a genuine sacrifice that makes you press into reliance upon God. That's really what fasting is about. Okay, so really quickly, why? First of all, it is a practice of Jesus and his followers. Number one, if Jesus did it, we do it. We're following after him. It's a spiritual discipline. It's an ancient practice of the people of God, as I've already said. So Jesus says in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, he says, when you fast. He doesn't say if. He just assumes as a follower of, G of him, when you fast. It says, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You see, Jesus is saying, fast from your heart, really, like from the inside out, like he can already see. If you're doing it with all the pomp and ceremony like the hypocrites, they've already got their reward. People are going, oh, poor you. That's it. That's all they're after. But God is after our heart. And that's what Jesus says um, about fasting. And he says, when, not if. So it, it's a practice of the people of Jesus. Why else? We... We fast in order to pray, pray with our body and pray with our words. We might be praying for breakthrough. We might pray for wisdom. In Acts, they fasted before they made big decisions. They, pray, they were fasting and praying for wisdom. They might, you might pray for, um, fast and pray for healing. You might fast and pray for deliverance, to be set free from something. 
Do you remember Jesus saying to his disciples, this only comes out by prayer and fasting. When they couldn't set the boy free, he tells them, you need to pray and fast. Why else? Well, to get all of our sustenance from the Holy Spirit. Someone said that fasting is feasting on on fellowship with God. Say that one again. Fasting is feasting on fellowship with God. Johnny puts it this way, not having what we want now in order to have what we want most. That's more of God. (laughs) Another one, John, John Piper, a brilliant theologian, he says this, ultimately we fast simply because we want God more than we want anything this world has to offer. So just as tithing is a practice that ensures that money doesn't control us, Fasting is a practice that helps us to ensure that our body and its desires don't control us. We are in control of it. In a similar way, the spiritual practices of omission, so that's things like fasting, chastity, frugality, secrecy, which is like giving up credit or praise. It's not like doing things in secret behind closed doors. It's, it's about giving up the credit and praise. Are an antidote for the sins of commission. So the practices of omission are an antidote to the sins of commission. So things like gluttony, sexual immorality, greed, and pride. Here's just a, a slide that I stole. Um, from someone way more intelligent than me that Alex hopefully can just put up now. Can you see that? It's really quite small, sorry. Um, But essentially it gives like a little table. Um, He calls it abstinence and engagement. So um, I'd call that abstinence, omission, and engagement, commission. And all of those are practices of the way of Jesus. There's only a few of them. There's lots, lots more. Um, And it puts them in those categories. It puts them in alone and in community and then abstinence and engagement. So I don't know if that's a kind of helpful graphic for you. Um, It certainly helped me to understand a little bit better some of the practices of Jesus. Anyway, fasting helps cultivate a spiritual hunger by forcing the hunger issue in us and making us ask if we really do hunger for God. And the fi- one of the final reasons I believe, and well, not final, there's loads, loads more, but I don't have time to cover them all. One of the final reasons I've got down here is um, fasting helps us to identify with the poor and disenfranchised. And in essence, it helps us to understand the heart of Father God more. So we all know, um, I'm sure there's a scripture, this um, Isaiah 58, this uh, scripture on fasting. If you've known Jesus a while, you'll know this one. It says this, Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. You see, this is the heart of the Father right here speaking to us. He's saying, when you're fasting, you're getting to know me more. You're getting closer to me. And in doing so, you'll understand that my heart is for the last, the least, and the lost. Those that are struggling. And in our own hunger, we can understand what it's like to be hungry not just spiritually, physically hungry. We get to understand that more and there's that whole new level of empathy with those that don't have. And in doing so, it helps us to pray in a more dynamic and powerful way. So 
I've gone with what, how, and why. I've got so much more that I could say. Fasting is a big, big topic, um, and I've tried to kind of do it in as short a space as possible. But I'd love.